state bank campus. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of lucky enough to have been in on that venture from the beginning. So this is sort of my third year at Cal West, and we're about to have our first cohort of seniors graduate, which is sort of at the end of this semester, which is already very exciting. Uh, so again, my, my area of specialty is, is looking at um, the history of maths, but primarily the, the kinds of problems that, um, that I think sort of motivate a certain kind of uh, trajectory within, within French philosophy. So that's uh, primarily the work of, of Gilles Deleuze. So what my paper does today is to try to, 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 try to chart the various sorts of um, issues and problems in the history of maths that are of interest to him, and to try to kind of sketch out how I think he uses them to try to determine and characterize what he thinks is significant in, in his own philosophical work. Um, so so I, I have a, a prepared paper, so I'll kind of move through that. Um, so I think that there's an open question about, uh, or in Deleuze scholarship, about exactly how to make sense of the seeming metaphysical commitments that are more or less explicit in Deleuze's philosophy. So explanations cover the range from uh, Manuel de Landa's material realism, which reduces metaphysics to abstract descriptions of physical processes, uh, to deployments of uh, Richard Rorty's anti-metaphysical ironism. Um, so what, what I claim in this paper is that Deleuze's metaphysics and the ontological commitments it seems to imply uh, can be understood in a deflationary way, uh, to be a metaphysics of the calculus that draws upon a conception of mathematics that's steeped in the implications of what I'm going to characterize as a, a subject naturalist, pragmatist approach um, to the question of mathematical foundations. So drawing upon the mathematics and the mathematical philosophy of, of Albert Lautmann, Deleuze considers mathematical theories to be responses to problems, the imminent conditions of which govern the very development of those theories. So Deleuze did not engage with foundational questions about how to ground those theories. Uh, indeed, the mathematical problem of primary interest to Deleuze it is not um, able to be stated in, in, a, in a formal proof. At least that's my kind of understanding, and I'm happy to be uh, a bit disillusioned on that. So Deleuze gives the metaphysics of the calculus he develops an informal characterization by tracing its development through the history of mathematics, drawing upon the work of Karl Weierstrass, uh, Henri Poincaré, Bernard Riemann, uh, and Hermann Weyl. So this history begins with the Leibnizian method of approximation, uh, using successive orders of the differential relation, which was developed into a theorem about power series expansions by Brooke Taylor in 1715, and for which uh, Lagrange attempted to provide um, an algebraic proof in about 17, in the 1770s. So this method is formalized in the calculus by Weierstrass's theory of analytic continuity uh, in about the 1870s. Uh, and, and this is a theory of integration as an approximation of functions from differential relations according to a process of summation in the form of series. And this uses Taylor series or, or power series expansions. So the history that Deleuze traces incorporates Poincaré's qualitative theory of differential equations, which provides a, a diagrammatic response to problems with the representation of meromorphic functions um, or, or divergent series. And, and these, this is, was a problem in, in Weierstrassian uh, analytic continuity. And, and Deleuze then further extends um, this to, to Riemann's concept of qualitative multiplicity or, or, or Riemann space. So the work of Weil on Riemann surfaces is instrumental to the development of the mathematical model that Deleuze develops. So Weil makes Riemann's intuitive representation of Riemann space more explicit by using a generalization of Weierstrass's analytic continuity. So effectively demonstrating that Riemann surfaces are the surfaces of Weierstrassian power series expansions. And Deleuze does this to show that Riemann space, or actually Weil does this, show that Riemann space is composed of Riemann surfaces and therefore uh, of Weierstrassian power series expansions. So it's by tracing the history of the philosophical engagement with and responses to the development of these mathematical problems that Deleuze develops uh, a metaphysics of the calculus, or what I'm calling metaphysics of the calculus, um, and which I argue provides a deflationary model for what seem to be his metaphysical commitments and the ontology implied by it. 
um, and, and, and these are developed in various sorts of places throughout this world. <coughs> so, so in this paper today, first I, I give an account of the mathematical problems that Deleuze uses to construct his model, and an account of how it functions as a model. Um, second, I'm going to borrow a little bit from early analytic philosophy, so uh, Carnap's deflationary philosophy of mathematics. And we're going to do this to characterize what I mean by um, the deflationary character of Deleuze's approach. Uh, and, and third, I position Deleuze's work within the context of contemporary pragmatism, uh, which I consider to be one of the more useful ways of thinking about how Deleuze's philosophy can contribute to contemporary philosophical debate. Okay, so first to the account of mathematical problems. Um, so it's important to note that Deleuze um, he is careful not to characterize his deployment of the metaphysics of the calculus as simply analogical or metaphorical. So he's careful to distinguish between those mathematical notions that are quantitative and exact in nature, which he considers it to be quite wrong to use metaphorically, um, because he considers them to belong to the exact sciences. Um, and those mathematical problems that are essentially inexact, yet completely rigorous, and which have led to important developments, not only in mathematics uh, and science in general, but also in other non-scientific areas, such as uh, philosophy and the arts. So Deleuze argues that this sort of notion is not unspecific because something's missing, um, but because of its nature and content. And so an example of an inexact and yet rigorous notion is something like Poincaré's qualitative theory of differential equations, which develops the concept of an essential singularity. So the different kinds of essential singularity that um, that are developed uh, or are developed by virtue of um, observed trajectories uh, and variables across a potential function, rather than because there is a specific formal mathematical proof of their existence. Another example uh, would be um, a Riemann space. So Bernard Riemann generalizes Gauss's work on the differential geometry of surfaces, uh, namely that the curvature of a surface embedded in three-dimensional space may be understood intrinsically to that surface, that is, independently of the three-dimensional space in which it's embedded. Um, and uh, Riemann generalizes this into uh, higher dimensions. So while Euclidean finite geometry holds for three-dimensional linear point configurations, curved three-dimensional spaces are not necessarily flat. However, these spaces still resemble Euclidean space in the infinitesimal neighborhood of each point. So by considering the infinitesimal neighborhood around each point as a small bit of Euclidean space, the entire space can then be constructed by the stepwise juxtaposition or accumulation of these infinitesimal neighborhoods. So the resulting Riemannian space can be defined as an assemblage of local spaces each of which can be mapped onto a flat Euclidean space without this determining the structure um, of the manifold or multiplicity as a whole. So while Deleuze recognizes that citing mathematical notions of the exact kind outside of their particular sphere would rightly expose one to the criticism of arbitrary metaphor or forced application, he defends the use he makes of mathematical notions of this inexact kind. And he does so on the grounds that by taking from these mathematical notions uh, what he characterizes as a particular conceptualizable character, which itself refers to non-scientific areas, um, he claims that the redeployment of this conceptualizable character in um, uh, non-specific uh, or non-scientific areas is justified. So what this means is that other non-scientific um, areas converge with science without applying it or making it a metaphor. So a useful way of characterizing the relation between the conceptualizable character of the inexact mathematical notion and this conceptualizable character as redeployed in other non-scientific areas, insofar as the latter converges with the former, is to refer to it as a, a modeling relation. So, so what I mean by this is that the conceptualizable character is redeployed in a non-scientific area, or as redeployed in a non-scientific area, is modeled on the conceptualizable character of the inexact mathematical notion. And so what distinguishes a modeling relation from a relation of analogy or metaphor is that there are correspondences without resemblance between them. So there's a correspondence between the conceptualizable character in each instance, 
However, there is no resemblance between the mathematical elements of the mathematical problem and the non-mathematical elements of the discourse in which this conceptualizing of character has been written. So it, it's, in, it's the conceptualizable character of the two examples above, or at least of how the former is implicated in the latter, that Deleuze redeploys in his philosophy. And so the conceptualizable character that Deleuze extracts from these mathematical notions is presented as a theory of mathematical problems uh, and would, would sound something like, um, you know, well-defined problems don't necessarily have rigorous solutions. Uh, indeed, informal diagrammatic representations of results do not provide solutions, but rather characterize the conditions of the problem itself. So for example, the conditions of the discontinuity or the potential function between the two discontinuous analytic functions in Poincaré's qualitative theory of differential equations, uh, which post vial or after vial sort of development would characterize the relations between discontinuous the discontinuous Riemann surfaces of a Riemann space. So Deleuze then uses this as a model to develop a general theory of problems and specifically philosophical problems. And he does this with the aid of constructing an alternative lineage in the history of philosophy that tracks these developments in mathematics. So one example might be uh, Maimon, who is a, 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 a near contemporary of Kant, uh, or, or is a contemporary of Kant. His, his, um, his, he had, offers an account of intuitions, his differentials. Um, and so this account of differentials allows Deleuze to incorporate a critique of representation within the structure of his own philosophy. And that's a critique that has a bearing on uh, Deleuze's relationship to Kant and Kant's philosophy. Um, Riemann's work allows Deleuze to critique and reconfigure Kant's pure intuitions of space and time along Bergsonian lines, although arguably modeled more effectively on the mathematics that inspired Bergson. So while Deleuze does refer to his project as developing uh, a mathesis universalis, he doesn't consider there to be a definite system of mathematical law in the face of, of nature, let's say. So mathematics is not privileged in this way over other discourses. There is, however, a peculiarity about the discourse of mathematics that distinguishes it from other discourses, and that is um, the very general nature of the relationship between the objects of this discourse, discourse, mathematics, and the ideas of those objects as expressed within mathematics. So mathematics is peculiar insofar as all of these objects are actually constructed by the discourse itself. And, and by this I just mean very generally that they're the product of the discursive practice of mathematics by mathematicians. They're not discovered empirically, let's say. And I take it as uncontroversial that there are mathematical objects and that these objects are abstract. So the ideas of the objects of mathematics are therefore directly and unproblematically related to the objects themselves. And, and this is regardless of the subsequent questions about the status of those objects uh, from the point of view of the philosophy of mathematics. So the independence of those objects, whether we're talking about objects or structures, or even about competing constructions uh, in mathematics itself. So it's for this reason that mathematics is figured as providing a model for our understanding of the nature of this relation between the objects of the discourse and the ideas of those objects as expressed within that discourse. Um, and this is in discourses other than that, mathematics where the relationship is, is far from straightforward. Okay, so um, here I'm drawing upon uh, implications. Well, in order to make this connection now between Deleuze's general understanding of mathematics and uh, a way of trying to kind of configure where Deleuze's approach might kind of fit within kind of recent um, developments within uh, philosophy. I'm going to kind of draw upon um, a, a pragmatist approach to, to philosophy, which I'm going to describe as the subject naturalism. And I'll try and give a bit of a sketch of what I mean by that. So, so drawing upon the implications of a subject naturalist approach to the question of mathematical foundations, um, or more specifically, the, the, the placement problem as that's understood within pragmatism. Um, as, as it arises in relation to the question of mathematical truths or mathemat math mathematical objects. So I want to kind of sketch how, how, how uh, the relevance of this and thinking through these problems that just laid out. So, so object naturalism um, presupposes a particular representational or referential view of the relationship between language and the natural world, which leads to a number of difficulties which can be referred to as, as placement problems. 
So they stem from a presupposition about the ontological scope of science. So roughly, the object naturalist assumption that all there is in the world um, is what is studied by science. So for instance, in mathematics, what are the natural facts we're talking about when referring to mathematical objects? Where are they to be placed? How are they to be located within a naturalistic framework, um, thus conceived? So the object naturalist response is to extend the presupposition of a representational view of language to mathematics and postulate mathematical objects that satisfy this presupposition, albeit um, independently, that is, independent of intelligent agents and their language, thought, and practices, um, or at least to countenance only those indispensable to best practice science um, for reasons of epistemic consistency and modesty. So what distinguishes object naturalism from subject naturalism, which is the position I'm going to defend, is, is that for the object naturalist, placement problems begin with the objects themselves. So the object naturalist's mistake, as far as a subject naturalist position is concerned, it is uh, precisely to follow the representationalist path by asking metaphysical questions directed at what is being spoken about. So whereas for the subject naturalist, placement problems originate as problems about human linguistic usage. So while agreeing with the requirement that there is a, a semantics that is uniform across both mathematical and non-mathematical discourse, the subject naturalist rejects the presuppositional, um, or sorry, the representational presupposition about the existence of mathematical objects that the object naturalist um, takes for granted. So the challenge for the subject naturalist is rather to explain in naturalistic terms how we come to talk in these various ways. So more generally, the those can be understood to be making an ambit claim to resolve placement problems about or along subject naturalist lines. So um, that is that his mathematical model provides an explanation in naturalistic terms about, for example, how we come to talk about objects representation. Now, in order to connect up this sort of account of subject naturalism with Deleuze's philosophy, I'm going to do a slight segue through um, one of the one of the main early 20th century uh, philosophers of mathematics that Deleuze draws upon, and this is the work of Albert Lauman. So I'm going to give just a quick sketch of what I think uh, is important from Lauman's work for uh, Deleuze's philosophy. So what is important about mathematics for Deleuze and Lauman um, is its, its seeming a priority, which allows the structure of problematic ideas or the mathematical theory of problems to be recognized as a component of the mathematical real, this is what Lauman refers to as the mathematical real, um, in, in a way that's not directly accessible in other discourses. So Deleuze takes Lauman's concept of the mathematical real, which includes you know, the sum of all mathematical theories and the structure of the problematic ideas that govern them as the basis for his reflections on the metaphysics of the calculus. And, and Deleuze casts this as a model for our understanding of the nature of the relationship between the objects of any one discourse and the structure of problematic ideas that govern them within that discourse. So insofar as he claims that all discourses can be modeled in this way, Deleuze argues that there is a mathesis universalis, but Deleuze is not positing a positive mathematical order to the universe, but he's rather nominating the Lautmanian mathematical <coughs> real and the metaphysics of the calculus that he characterizes by means of it as a model for our understanding of the structure of other discourses. So what, what, uh, well, what does Deleuze mean by the structure of the problematic idea? Uh, or ideas that govern the development of mathematical theories, um, which is included in Lauman's concept of the mathematical real, uh, and, and which I, I think uh, forms the basis of Deleuze's metaphysics of the calculus. Um, hopefully, what I'm going to say in, a few, in the next few minutes is going to help to kind of make that clear. So, so Lauman subscribed to a platonic understanding of the structure of the problematic idea. However, he understands these to be um, abstract dialectical ideas, not universal forms. So archetypes or ideals, um, which are the touchstones for the selective and organizational uh, function <coughs> of the dialectic, uh, and re re which remain revisable in the face of the demands of that organization. So it's important to note that Lautmann's references to a dialectic of ideas should not be understood as being references to a general dialectic that exists independently of the mathematics. Lautmann's quite explicit in claiming 
that the dialectical idea is, is, is the fourth point of view of the mathematical real. So for that, then, ideas constitute, along with mathematical facts, objects, and theories, um, a fourth, fourth point of view of the mathematical real. And he argues that far from being opposed, these four conceptions fit naturally together. So the facts consist in the discovery of new entities. These entities are organized in theories. And the movement of these theories uh, incarnates the schema of connections of certain ideas. And so for this reason, the mathematical real depends not only on the base of mathematical facts, but also on dialectical ideas that govern the mathematical theories in which they are actualized. So the mathematical real is not just the sum of all mathematical theories. So the former should therefore not be collapsed into the latter. To do so would lead to the mistaken thesis that mathematics provides evidence of an external and more general dialectic that is equally accessible by means of some kind of analysis performed in regard to or from within the discourse. So what seems to be clear in that one's work is that he considers himself to be working within the constraints of the discourse of mathematics and the structure of the dialectic that he presents is determined as operating within the expanded concept um, of mathematics that he made the claim to, so the mathematical real. So the dialectic of ideas is independent of the mathematical theories or the mathematics per se, but not of the expanded understanding of the mathematical real. So Lautner does claim that the structure of the dialectic is not the sole privy of the mathematical real, and that it can therefore also be found in other discourses. However, he does not claim that this is the case because the dialectic is able to be generalized, or insofar as it is transcendent with respect to the mathematical real. Um, so while Lamp makes strong claims to the unity of mathematics, which at the time in the early 20th century was, uh, was controversial, um, perhaps remains so today, um, he does not make any claim whatsoever to the unity of the discourses. So what Lautmann argues rather is that this is the case because the way that the structure of the dialectic operates in the mathematical real functions as a model for recognizing how it can be understood to operate within other discourses. So Lautmann maintains that we are able to recognize the logic of relations structured by the dialectic, sorry, by the dialectic in other discourses solely by virtue of the mathematical theories in which these relations are incarnate. Um, so he argues that the effectuation of these connections is immediately mathematical theory. So that is to say that it is it's in the way in which mathematical logic is deployed in other discourses that allows such a discourse to be understood to operate according to the dialectic. So by, by dialectic, that means here the dialectic of the mathematical real. So mathematics is not um, privileged over other discourses according to that way, because on the one hand, it doesn't consider there to be a definite system of mathematical laws in the base of nature. And on the other hand, he does consider it to be um, intimately involved in our understanding of the very dialectical structure of those discourses. So what this amounts to is that mathematical theories are not the sole privy of mathematics or of the mathematical real. They also provide the ground for understanding how the dialectic operates in other discourses. So when Lautmann argues that mathematical logic does not enjoy in this respect any special privilege, it is only one theory among others, and the problem that it raises or that it solves are found almost identically elsewhere. By privileged, we should also stand exclusive to the mathematical theory. And so while Lautmann subscribed to a platonic understanding of the structure of the problematic idea, Deleuze draws upon the comments of Caves, who uh, was a contemporary of Lautmann, um, and who indeed was critical of certain aspects of Lapin's work. Um, so Deleuze draws upon Caveres to characterize problematic ideas as being rather, instead of uh, drawing upon Platonic inspiration, um, Deleuze wants to argue, using Caveres, that um, problematic ideas are rather imminent to the problems themselves. And so the example from mathematics that Deleuze uses to characterize the imminent nature of problematic ideas and thus of a more general uh, mathematical theory of problems, is the question of the solvability of polynomial equations. And so I kind of want to track through a little bit of what, how Deleuze characterizes that history in order to give the sort of mathematical background to what he is going to propose as, as a model for problems in general. Um, so a mathematical model that I think Deleuze wants to argue is generalizable as a model of any kind. So, um, 
in relation to the solvability of polynomial equations, uh, Lagrange provided a unified understanding of the general formulas for determining um, the solutions to polynomial equations of degree less than or equal to 4. However, he was unable to do the same for Quintings uh, and suggested that they might not be solvable in this way. So Abel provided the first conclusive proof of this conjecture. He proved that despite some specific quintics actually having solutions, it was impossible to construct an algebraic formula that solved all quintics. So the question of the solvability of quintics provides an example of a mathematical problem, the condi conditions of which are imminent to the problem itself, and which is characteristic of a more general mathematical theory of problems. So, um, to spell this out a little bit further, I'm going to go on to some of the subsequent developments in relation to um, Abel's work. Galois uh, developed a more complete theory uh, of the solvability of higher degree polynomial equations. Uh, and so by showing that a simpler proof of Abel's uh, result could be found along purely group theory lines. So Deleuze argues that Galois' theory is not simply another example or expression of the mathematical theory of problems, but rather a formal restatement of the theory of problems as such in purely group theoretic terms. So Galois' theory unites in one formal theory those aspects of the theory of problems representing Poincaré's quality of theory of differential equations. So Galois' theory allows the formal presentation of a feature that remains only intuitive in Poincaré's quality of theory of differential equations. So this is namely uh, the leap of the variable across the cut of the potential function in the diagrammatic representation of essential singularities. And, and which are determined in relation to the problem of the representation of barometric functions, where more formal solutions remain uh, elusive. So we now have a formal proof of the mathematical theory of problems. However, the differences in kind between differential calculus and group theory, namely the formalization of the latter versus the informal intuitive results of the former, are merely secondary on, on Deleuze's record. What's, in, what's important is that they are each characterization of the mathematical expression of problems as such. So this distinction between formal and informal characterizations of the mathematical expression of problems is important for determining how Deleuze's approach to the relation between mathematics and philosophy differs from those committed to the foundationalist approaches to the philosophy of mathematics. So this sets up um, the, the mathematical real that Deleuze gets from Lauten and the structure of the theory of problems as it operates in the mathematical world to function as a model for the structure of other discourses and for how we can understand these other discourses to operate. So it's the conceptualizable character of the mathematical theory of problems as a theory of problems that allows other discourses to be understood to operate according to a theory of problems or to be structured by a theory of problems modeled on a theory of problems in mathematics. So what distinguishes Deleuze from those committed to foundational approaches to, to the philosophy of mathematics is that Deleuze's claims are not dependent on the success um, of one or other of the foundational approaches to provide foundations in mathematics. Deleuze's claims are rather epistemically modest. So rather than being drawn into making the claim that the model he is proposing is the mathematical model, which is dependable by virtue of being underpinned by a particular foundational approach to mathematics, for Deleuze, the proposed model is simply a model um, that he considers to be uh, more useful than other potential models. So even though Galois' theory is a formal restatement of the theory of problems in purely group theoretic terms, throughout his work, Deleuze prefers and continues to draw upon the informal model that brings together Biostraus, Poincaré, and Riemann, and remains quiet or is epistemically modest in regards to mathematical foundations. So the work of Deleuze does more than merely provide a descriptive account of the metaphysics or of a metaphysics of the calculus as the foundations for the operation of all discourses. Rather, in his work develops an argument for a particular kind of metaphysics of the calculus that can be understood to operate in relation to other discourses by virtue of the way it operates as a theory of problems in mathematics. So he borrowing the expanded account of mathematics derived from that one's concept. So the detail of the structure of the metaphysics of calculus and the theory of problems that it characterizes can only be offered in mathematical terms. However, the structure of this theory, uh, of this theory of problems, can be used to model the structure and mode of operation of problems in other discourses. So for Deleuze, the manner by means of which 
a mathematical theory is implicated infinitely in the conditions of the problem that it determines, um, serves as a model for the manner by means of which a philosophical concept is implicated in the philosophical conditions of the problem which determines it. So he, therefore there's a, a correspondence between the structure of the theory of problems in mathematics and the structure of theory of problems um, that's deployed in Deleuze's philosophy as far as the latter is a model, uh, is a model on the former. So Deleuze wants to say that there's correspondences without resemblance between them insofar as the structure of the theory of problems conditions each discourse but without there being a resemblance between those respective problems that do the condition. And so to track through a kind of a, a, a few examples in order to try to kind of characterize this, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Deleuze's critique of representation. <coughs> so the philosophical implications of this modeling relation are developed by Deleuze in his critique of representation or of the presumption of a connection between an idea and something in the world that it represents. Uh, and this, this argument is presented in difference of repetition. So for Deleuze, the idea is not bound to the representation of an object or a concept, uh, nor is it the property of individual consciousness. So differences in Deleuze's uh, sense of the term is also not tied to representation. Thus, it does not involve a comparison of one available or given thing um, or concept to another. Deleuze insists that the difference is not and cannot be thought in itself so long as it is subject to the requirements of representation. So what one aspect of the way that mathematics models the theory of problems for Deleuze is that the mathematics that he draws upon to develop this model also actually models the nature of the illusory relation um, of representation between an idea and that which it represents in discourses other than that. So Deleuze draws here upon the work of, um, of Maimon to develop this aspect of his critique of representation. And so according to Maimon, the operation of integration functions as a mathematical rule of the understanding that is applied to the elements of sensation, which are modeled on differentials, in order to account for how manifolds of sensation are brought to consciousness as sensible objects of intuition. So here, the determinate units of different manifolds of sensation are projected to be qualitatively different differentials. What appear to us as external objects are therefore constructed as such by the understanding, and the retrospective explanation of the construction is that it is the result of the application of a mathematical rule of the understanding to the elements of sensation. So in the first step of the process, two different manifolds of sensation characterized by different differentials are brought into consciousness by virtue of the application of integration as a rule of the understanding to the elements of sensation or, or differentials. So the method of integration that Maimon deploys as a rule of the understanding to proceed from differentials to functions or from projected elements of sensation to the qualities of sensible objects is the method of approximation of a differential function around a given point provided by the process of summation in the form of a Taylor series or power series expansion. So what is eventually formalized by Weierstrass as analytic continuity, so the real relation between the two qualities themselves as sensible objects is modeled on the mathematical relationship between their differentials. So a primary physical judgment is then made about the products of integration, which determines them as sensible objects. So what this amounts to is that all physical judgments whatsoever are predicated on a prior mathematical judgment which escapes consciousness. It's therefore an illusion uh, that sensible or real objects appear as external to us, when in fact they are uh, the product of our understanding. Okay, so I, I'm going to turn to um, Kana in order to sort of try to characterize what I think is this sort of deflationary uh, account of metaphysics that uh, we can sort of construct by virtue of these sort of models and the this work. So the metaphysics of the calculus on which Deleuze models his um, theory of problems um, is, I argue, like a, a deflationary metaphysics model of mathematics. So I claim that it is a deflationary metaphysics because I want to argue that the mathematics on which it is modeled can be understood according to a deflationary philosophy of mathematics. So while the philosopher of mathematics most influential on Deleuze is Albert Malkin, a more straightforward example of a philosophy of mathematics that is useful to get our bearings with respect to Deleuze's approach to mathematics 
Here's the deflationary philosophy of mathematics developed by um, Rudolf Carnap in the early 20th century. So Carnap recommends uh, a principle of, of, of a principle, or rather, an attitude of tolerance with respect to the choice of a formal language as the language for science, where the reference to formal language is inclusive of, but not necessarily restricted to, one or other of the competing contenders to provide a foundation for mathematics. So the principle of tolerance maintains that there are no conditions to be placed on the choice of a candidate language beyond a certain level of clarity about which logic is actually being chosen. So one can present any properly constructed set of linguistic forms and then announce that one has chosen to use it. So one of the main objectives of the principle of tolerance uh, was to provide a way around wrangling over foundations uh, of mathematics. So Carnap favors the adoption of a language that builds in classical mathematics and recommends this as a constraint on candidate languages for the language of science. So this recommendation can, of course, be rejected in, in favor of some other formal language uh, without giving up tolerance. And so that's the point of uh, calling them recommendations. So how might Deleuze's approach to mathematics fit with Carnap's principle, principle of tolerance? On the one hand, Deleuze does not engage with foundational questions, as I've tried to say. Um, so, you know, about how theories are grounded, and he doesn't make any explicit commitment to a foundational program in mathematics. Um, so there are moments within Deleuze's work and his collaborative work with uh, one of his French colleagues, uh, Guattari, where they do comment on intuitionist, uh, the intuitionist school, so Brewer, Haiti, and Greece, and, um, and Bouligan. Um, so they, they insist that it is of great importance to mathematics, not because it asserted the irreducible rights of intuition, or even because it elaborated a very novel constructivism, but because it developed a concept of problems um, and of a, a calculus of problems that intrinsically rivals um, the axiomatics of sort of set theory and proceeds by, by other rules, notably uh, with regard to the excluded middle. So what Deleuze does is he, he extracts this concept of the calculus of problems itself as a mathematical problematic from the episode in the history of mathematics when intuition is opposed axiomatics. And it's the, the logic of this calculus of problems, which is characteristic of the metaphysics of the calculus, that he then redeploys in relation to a, a range of episodes in the history of mathematics that in no way binds him to the principles of intuitionism. So it may appear at first as though Deleuze might need to reject Carnap's recommendation um, in, in favour of a candidate language that underpins the mathematical problems of primary interest to him. Indeed, it may even appear as though by adopting an informal mathematic, mathematical problem, he is rejecting the formal requirement outright. Um, on, rejection, uh, on reflection, however, neither, neither of these proves to be the case. So Deleuze does consider the mathematical theory problems to have been formalized in Galois' root theoretic proof of the solvability of higher degree polynomial equations. The candidate language of choice need therefore only ground Galois' root theoretic Proof. And since the proof of Galois' theory is able to be provided using classical mathematics, the formal aspect of Deleuze's approach is actually in line with Carnap's recommendation. However, the mathematical problem of primary interest to Deleuze, and which features prominently in the model he constructs, is not ultimately reducible to a formal proof, and is therefore not consistent with the range of choices for a formal language as the language of science. So Deleuze isn't proposing an alternative candidate language for the language of science per se, since the model he constructs is not formally robust enough for that purpose. So the theory of problems derived from Deleuze's informal model is the same as that furnished by a group theory approach. It just arrives at this theory by other means, albeit informal mathematical means. So what Deleuze gains by this selection is a mathematical model that affords him a critical perspective on representation not available in a group theory. So like Carnap, Deleuze uh, recognises a significant difference between mathematics and natural science. In a word, sense experience is relevant to science, but irrelevant to mathematics. However, rather than just aiming to provide a way of understanding this difference that avoids the thickets of philosophical wrangling which have arisen uh, from its consideration, Deleuze can be understood to go one step further by finding in the informal mathematical problems that he selects a way to use the relevance of sense experience in obtaining informal results for mathematical problems to model the operation of sense experience relevant not only to science, but to all discursive practices relying on representation. 
so I, I've argued that the metaphysics of the capitalist, on which Deleuze models his theory of problems, is a deflationary uh, metaphysics model of a subject naturalist understanding of mathematics and a deflationary approach to uh, questions of its foundations. And so insofar as Deleuze can be understood to be making an amber claim that his mathematical model does resolve placement problems along subject naturalist lines, I would argue that it is naturalist in the requisite way for subject naturalist pragmatism. For example, it provides an explanation in naturalistic terms about, for example, how we come to talk about objects representationally, and in doing so, it properly defers to science. However, despite this, it's probably not quietest enough on metaphysics for the subject naturalist pragmatist. So subject naturalist pragmatists, in addition to being representational quietists, are metaphysical quietists. So that's not anti-realist, but quietist on realism. So where quietism about a particular vocabulary amounts to a rejection of that vocabulary for the purposes of philosophical theory. So despite its subject naturalist orientation, Deleuze's selection of the particular informal model he deploys is for the purpose of ontological speculation, which puts it at odds with the metaphysical quietism of subject naturalist pragmatism. So pragmatists would therefore consider such issues and the speculative efforts to account for them to be too ontological, and therefore to lie outside of philosophy per se, as conceived by subject naturalist pragmatism. So indeed, Deleuze's non-representation non-representationalism is also probably not quietest enough on representation for the subject naturalist pragmatist. So for this reason, I'd like to propose that Deleuze rather be thought of as a speculative subject naturalist pragmatist. So characterizing Deleuze's work as being speculative subject naturalist pragmatism would on this view be something like speculative ontology, which I don't necessarily have a problem with. Indeed, it squares well with uh, my own research, which I've been discussing today on Deleuze. So even within the subject naturalist pragmatist fold, uh, there are different views about what counts as philosophy for the subject naturalist pragmatist. And um, here I'm going to draw upon two, um, two of my kind of colleagues at, at Sydney University when I was there. So um, uh, uh, MacArthur and Price. So MacArthur's pragmatism differs from Price insofar as MacArthur questions whether or not some of the investigations in science that Price actually undertakes actually count as philosophy on, on, on this model. So Price concedes that this is no challenge to his kind of pragmatism as such, but only to its right to call itself philosophy. So such concessions are instructive both for Deleuzeans and the pragmatists. Um, so even though pragmatists may well turn their backs on what I'm calling Deleuze's speculative subject naturalist pragmatism, his speculative approach, to borrow a phrase from Price, is at least compatible with, if not mandated by, the pragmatist doctrine that we um, understand problematic notions in terms of their practical significance. <coughs> so not only does this approach provide a useful way of thinking about how Deleuze's philosophy can contribute to contemporary philosophical debate, um, it also has the flexibility to underpin research in all areas of Deleuze's studies, at least that's my claim. Um, regardless of the particular interdisciplinary mix. Um, so I realize that some of those mathematical problems that I might have been referring to might be unfamiliar to some of you. Um, uh, I might be able to sketch out a little bit more clearly what they entail in question time, but that's at least the, the broad um, paper that I was able to present and discuss with you this afternoon.